And I want you to take your Bibles and turn with me here to the book of Romans chapter 8. I had the privilege of preaching in chapel this past Friday and challenging our young people. And I believe God has led to go down this path along this line of our faith and how we're overcomers and conquerors through Jesus Christ. We have so many different blessings that God has given us in Christ. Oftentimes we don't claim them because we don't know them. Sometimes we know them, but we don't claim them because they must be claimed by faith. So many times we claim them for a little while and then we kind of give up and we just let go of holding to those promises because certain things maybe didn't happen in a certain way that we hoped and prayed or in a certain time. And so we just like, oh, well, you know, maybe there's something truly wrong with me. I must be fatally flawed, spiritually speaking. Who am I to think God could really do something through my life? And I want you to know this, that there's not a person that God has ever used that was ever worthy, that was ever deserving, that was ever superior to someone else. God doesn't use the wise and uh, the powerful and the mighty of this world. God uses the meek and the humble and the broken and the foolish even. Think about it. God uses us oftentimes in spite of ourselves. God is not so much looking for ability this morning as much as God is truly looking for availability. Are we available to the Lord? Do we have a nobility of character and heart? That means a genuine desire to be committed and consecrated to Christ to do His will. I think if more of us would live in the reality of who we are in Christ, I believe we'd see God do more. I believe we'd see more prayers answered and needs met. I believe that God could help us. Some of us need breakthroughs in different areas. I was praying this morning, Lord, I need a breakthrough in this area. I wonder what area do you need a breakthrough in? You've been burdened. You've been carrying something for a long, long time. Don't lose heart. Humble yourself before the Lord and seek God. Be willing to call on the Lord and say, God, would you move me forward in this area of my life, in this area of faith? Please help me, dear God. God is able to do that. We read here in Romans chapter 8, in verse number 37, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. I like that last phrase there too, through him that loved us. For the Bible says in verse 38 and 39, for I am persuaded, I'm convinced beyond doubt. I have it settled in my heart that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Are you in Christ this morning? If you have believed on him by faith as your personal savior, you are in Christ and Christ is in you in the person of the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says there's nothing, nothing. Look at the list here. There's nothing that is able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And all of God's people said, amen. Amen. Thank God for that. So we read in verse 37 again. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Through him, that's where the victory is. Because there is nothing, nor anyone, according to verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ. There is not only nothing, but there is no one that can separate us from the love of God, which is in Jesus Christ. I like When God asked these questions in verse 31, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? What does it matter who is against us? Who will win if God is on our side? Notice verse 33, who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. You've got someone falsely charging you or accusing you in some way, trying to intimidate you. Just know that before God, you are innocent. You are not guilty. 
You have been forgiven and set free. Your redemption is bought and paid for in full. Thank God for that. Verse 34. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Another phrase there I like, for us. We read it not only in verse 34, but we read it in verse 32. He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? If God would give his own son for you, what need do you have that he will not give to you? If someone would give their son for you, what would they not give to you? And if you already have received his son, what do you need now to receive by faith that God has promised to supply? We also read back in verse 26, Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us. There it is, underline that, for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. The Holy Spirit is interceding on our behalf. He lives within us as true children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. And as a result now, we know that even when we cannot put words to our prayers, God, the Holy Spirit, knowing our heart, intercedes on behalf of us at the throne of grace. And he says, now, Father, here's what he needs. Here's what she's trying to say. Here's what these tears indicate. The first song ever sung in church is an 18-year-old Young Christian, tears are a language God understands. Spurgeon said, tears are liquid prayers. I'm glad that God understands the language of tears. And the Holy Spirit takes those yearnings which cannot be uttered, cannot be put in words, those groanings, have you ever got on your knees to pray and, and you couldn't even word it? All you could do is just sigh or groan. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, Lord. You just couldn't put it in words. You ever been that broken? I'm telling you, it's then that the Holy Spirit intercedes on our behalf. Isn't that wonderful? For us. If God be for us, who can be against us? If God would deliver up his son for us, how shall he not with him freely give us all things? Think about what God is saying here. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? What shall separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing, the Bible says, shall be able to. No wonder he declares in verse 37, in all these things, no matter what we face in life, we are more than conquerors. This expression here, more than conquerors, has the thought of to vanquish beyond, to gain a decisive victory over. The thought is we have more than conquered the enemy through Christ. Now, there are some battles you fight and you win, but the enemy kind of regathers himself and maybe goes and gets more help and then comes after you again, right? And you're thinking, wow, I might not win this time. That's not the way it is with Christ and our adversary, the devil. When Christ cried, it is finished. The power of Satan and sin was broken forevermore. In Jesus Christ, he's been utterly decimated. He will never rise again in conquering power above the people of God to take us away from God. Our enemy has been utterly wiped out and destroyed, never to rise up against us again. Praise God for that. Aren't you thankful today that we're more than conquerors? We didn't just win through Christ, but we won decisively. Our enemy has been vanquished. And he has no power over us. May we not give place to him. We don't have to. Praise God for that. And so in Christ, we're more than conquerors. 
In Christ, we have overcome. Look with me and just write some things down quickly, if you will. John chapter 16. Turn to John chapter 16. Notice what Christ said in verse 33. These things have I spoken unto you that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world in Christ. I am a conqueror in Christ. I am overcoming the world. I hope you'll write that down. I am overcoming the world. Now let me ask you this morning. Is the world overcoming you? Or are you overcoming the world? See, we are in the world, but not of it. We must, as a church, go into the world. The church mo- must go into the world. We must not let the world come into the church when it comes to the world's spirit and values and philosophies. You know, it's okay for a boat to be in the water. It's not okay when the water gets in the boat. And see, that's where we are if we're not careful as Christians. We're in this world, the water of this world. But we've got to try by the grace of God to keep the water of the world's values and spirit out of the vessel of our lives. The Bible speaks of vessels unto honor and vessels unto dishonor. I like all kinds of vessels. Some of you, if you have a pet at home, you've got, say, like a, a water bowl for your dog. And I mean, it may be nice. It may have his name on it, Fido. Andrew's dog is Leo. You know, you might look at that dog bowl and think, wow, that's really nice. I'm sure my dog appreciates that. Let me ask you, would you go home and drink water out of it? Now, that's a vessel, but it's not really a clean vessel. You understand? And it won't be used for certain things. Think about it. God said there are vessels among saved people. There are vessels that God can use and vessels that he can't or can't in certain ways. You understand? Now, the thing that we've got to be reminded of this morning is that we are as close to God as we want to be. There's nothing that's holding us back. He said, draw now to me and I'll draw now to you. The only thing that's holding you back or me back this morning is a choice that we make in and of ourselves to not seek God, to not humble ourselves, to not say, God, I want to be a vessel unto honor. Would you cleanse me? Would you help me? Holy Spirit, work in my heart and in my life. Show me anything that is there that doesn't need to be there that's hindering your work within. As the old preacher prayed, we ought to spend some time with God this week individually and say, Lord, search me, know my heart, know my thoughts, try me. See if there be any wicked way in me. Show me, Lord. Deal with me thoroughly, Lord. Deal with me thoroughly. Jesus said, I have overcome the world. In Jesus Christ, we are overcoming the world. Have you noticed the world's trend? Take someone with an ability. Let's say a clean cut, moral, but talented young person. Let the world get a hold of a young person like that. And after a while, you won't even recognize them. Now, I want you to get this. The world is corrupt. I'm talking to the world system, its philosophies, its spirit, its values, its practices. Let the philosophy and the spirit of the world that is anti-God, apart from God, opposite of God, get someone like that for its own purposes. And after a while... What is the trending pattern in their lives? It's just as 2 Timothy says. But evil men and seducers shall do what? Wax worse and worse. Worse and worse. So many talented young people have been devoured by the world. Gifted. Able. And yet, just simply destroyed by some kind of substance or sin. Amazing, is it not? Now I want everybody to hear this. So don't miss this point this morning, this truth. Do you realize that in Christ, the Bible says we go from faith to faith? 
we add to our faith virtue and to virtue knowledge. Do you see that? The building blocks of the Christian life make Christ more evident in our lives and in our character and in our spirit and in our conduct. You see, we can get stronger and stronger. Young people, you think right now, I just don't know about this thing. I mean, the world is calling. It's got so much to offer me and it does. You think, listen, I can handle it. I I can take it and grab it. And, and, and just lay hold of everything this world has to offer me. And my life is just going to get better and better. I promise you, you will not be the exception, nor will I. It's not going to get better and better. That's not the nature of sin. Sin will wreak havoc in your life. It won't always do it immediately. It won't always do it up front. Sometimes it will. But it will always take its toll over time. Think of that. Worse and worse. From worse to worse. You say, well, my life right now, I just don't like it. I'm, I don't, I don't, I'm not really that happy. You know, I'm looking for something else to make it better. Listen, if you look for this world, it won't get better. I mean, you might have a temporary bump in your life, you know. Like, hey, I'm free. I'm on my own. doing my own thing. There is pleasure in sin. The sin's season is so short when you think about the long haul of your life. This is not a sprint. It's a marathon. Where are you going to be years from now? You know what's amazing? They said when this Carrie Fisher died, 60 years of age, they said that she had drug use in her earlier years, and they believed that that had the consequence that affected and caused her heart attack at age 60. I know of two other people personally that have said, even though I got saved, my early drug use took its toll on my body. Think about that. I want to tell you young people today especially, as well as adults, adults get caught up in things today. I saw where a mother was grieving her daughter in her early 20s that died of an overdose in a local Taco Bell restroom where they lived. Our senator, Tom Tillis, said it's an epidemic, heroin. An epidemic. It's ripping lives apart. Destroying lives. And yet young people think, well, you know, I can try a little bit. I can experiment with it. Hey, I can rise above it. I'll be okay. You know, this is just me sowing my wild oats. I'll just kind of get beyond that phase after a while and and I'll settle in and and, and I'll be all right. I'll leave it all behind. Hey, listen, you, you might, you might be able to survive that and leave it behind at some point. But I'll tell you what, the consequence, the toll it could take on your body physically. I will tell you, it's not worth it. Sin offers you so much good, but it delivers so much bad instead. God help you not to believe the lie of this world. The world has devoured so many. And you know what? You're not above it. Neither am I. We're no match for sin, but praise God, sin is no match for our Savior. And in Jesus Christ, we don't have to yield to sin. We can overcome the world. Are you overcoming today? Are you an overcomer? Or are you a succumber? You're succumbing to this world. You're being overcome. Oh, my heart, as I think about this, the world, young people, listen. I mean, I've got other points. If this is all that God wants me to say today, I want to be led of the Spirit of God. There may be some young person in the balance today. I don't know. But I'm telling you, this world, it's glitz and it's glamour and it shows you all that it's got to offer. But I'll tell you what, it doesn't show people in the back alleys. It doesn't show people in the hospitals. It doesn't show people in the mental ward. It doesn't show people with broken lives or in early graves. It doesn't show those people. I tell you, the brokenness of sin, it's all around. And yet, if you just watch the media of this day, and if, you're, and if your face is just glued to your phone all day long, and, and you're looking at the world, you're thinking, man, they're having a time. 
Boy, look at what all the world is doing and what am I doing but missing out. I'll tell you, one day, one day by the grace of God, you're going to bless the Lord's name that you did miss out on so much of this sorrow and heartache that this world threw your way through temptation and sin. God in heaven have mercy on us. May God spare someone even in this hour. I'm telling you, Worse and worse is what you have to look forward to with the light you have if you turn away from God and say, no, I'm going to embrace this world wide open. I'm telling you what, you're going to turn around one day and you're going to see other people who were blessed and prospered in their lives. You're going to say, well, well, why do they have things that they enjoy and I can't? Because they had a choice like you have a choice. Now you hear me. I thank God that he can forgive us. And I'm glad he's the God of the second chance, the third chance, and the fourth. Because I've needed every one of those. Amen. Amen. But I'm telling you what, there's some of us, and I've been burned by sin. I have. Why do you think I preach with such a passion? Because I don't want you to hurt like I've hurt, much less dishonor God. And those of us who've been hurt by sin, we ought to have a greater zeal. For this generation to love them and pray for them and to reach out to them and not in any way encourage them down a path of sin or down a path of disregard to God or mom or dad or the things of God in the house of the Lord. We should not in any way have a part in encouraging someone even in the slightest way away from God. We ought to do everything we can to encourage them toward God. At the end of the day you have a choice. We all have a choice. I thank God that I chose to look to Christ and live and not wallow in the consequence of my sin. And I don't know if that's where someone is today. I'm telling you what, this is not the time to get haughty over our sin. This is the time to get broken by our sin. Isn't that right? This is the time to say, Lord, please help me. Lord, please speak to me. You know what's amazing is we used to have a zeal for God and against sin and that's cooled in many of our lives. And now if we're not careful we just balk and take exception when the Spirit of God wants to move and it's like, well don't get on my sin. Or, you know, because I have stumbled and I I do struggle with certain things, you know, I'm going to take this and receive it like, you know, someone's against me or trying to just... Rub my nose in this. You better watch that attitude. Because I can tell you this, when we're truly repentant and humble before the Lord, we won't be looking for affirmations. That, well, I know you did wrong, but it's okay that you did wrong. It's not okay when we do wrong. I'm thankful that we're still loved, aren't you? And God can bring good out of bad. But if we're not careful, that's the path I believe we follow. We just want to minimize sin. We want to act like it's not that bad. I'll tell you what, it's not only bad, but it's worse than we even can conceive it. And sometimes it's so subtle in our lives. And I'm telling you, God wants to speak to us and God wants to deliver us and God wants to save some young person perhaps in this service today. Not next week, not next year, but today from making a decision to act independently of God. And embrace something this world has to offer you in the place of what God has to offer you. It's as though we have a generation and we've seen this. You know, everyone gets a trophy. This generation is so entitled. Even preachers, when we preach on sin rather than being broken, it's like, well, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, I know my kids aren't perfect, but I'll tell you what, I hope he's not. I hope he don't go after them. I'll tell you what, you better pray the Holy Spirit to go after your children. Amen. You better pray that God Almighty will ring their bell. Yes, sir. You better pray that God will get their attention. Amen? Yes. We better pray. We better love them more than ourselves. You know what I've learned? Parents who overly indulge their children and excuse their sin and get upset if anybody else tries to help deal with that for the good of that child. I've learned this. Those parents don't love those children as much as they think they do themselves. They love themselves more than they love them children, their children. That's why they're continually defending their sin. 
Because it's all about me. It's all about what I think or what I want or what I desire for my child. You know what? Did you dedicate that child to the Lord? If you did, that means you took your hands off of him or her. And you said, Lord, this child belongs to you and help me to raise him or her for your glory. Is that not what you prayed? Why would you take that back and not want God to deal with them? I'm telling you, our children are sinners just as much as we are. Isn't that true? And their hearts are desperately wicked like our own. Now you say, preacher, does that mean we're, we don't like them or we're upset with them? No, it means we love them so much. We understand their challenges and their struggles and their temptations. And we've lived it long enough. Have we not been down the path, some of us, long enough and been burned by sin deep enough that we have a zeal to say, now listen, guard your heart, guard your mind. I think the great challenge of this hour, well, we, that's why we've got to have red hot church services and spirit filled singing and preaching. Because I want to tell you, the flesh profiteth nothing. We can't do anything by the arm of the flesh, but it is the spirit that gives life. Praise God. And that's what this generation needs in this hour. They don't need pettiness. They don't need pride. They don't need a haughty, divisive spirit. They don't need people who've got their own little ideas and they try to pit people against each other and they just in it for themselves to so look out for themselves. May God in heaven pull the veil off of that in each of our lives and show us where we stand before him. Because at the end of the day, Listen, there's no reason we don't live in this victory that God has given. I want to live in it, don't you? I want to know this. Listen, if I let myself, if I let myself, I could quit a long time ago because I wasn't raised in church. And I, in certain ways, didn't know better. I truly didn't. And you know what? I'm not proud of that, but I could have talked myself out of serving God a long, long time ago. But I'm glad when I was struggling with that, I thought, well, listen, I better get in the Bible and find out really what the Bible says about this. And I'm glad I did, because where I found I came up short, I also found that Jesus Christ made up the difference. And what I couldn't do, he could. And though he knew everything about me when he saved me and called me to preach, he still saved me. And he still called me to preach. I thank God for that today. I'm happy to be saved and forgiven. And I'm telling you, I believe it's one reason why God's given me a heart for people, especially this children's home. I want to see God prevail upon the heartaches and the disappointments of life that people face. Because in Christ we are more than conquerors. God help us to live in that victory. God help this generation not to see that, well, you can go to church and everybody can just kind of sit there and endure it and then we can all go home and then maybe take exception with something that was said and then just kind of ignore it and go our merry way the rest of the week and just act like it's no big deal in our lives. God in heaven, forgive us. God, forgive us for that spirit. And God, help us to take hold of God. And some of us used to be closer to God than we are right now. Now's a good time to draw now to God and say, Lord, you know what? I used to pray more than I'm praying right now. And I'm sorry. I need to repent of that. Lord, I used to be in your word. I used to be zealous for you. I used to be a witness for you, Lord. I used to pray and fast and seek you. You know what? Here's the good news. I'm glad even when we fail the Lord, he does not fail us and he will not deny us. Aren't you glad for that today? He will never deny us as his own. And my heart is this. I heard Brother Lou Rossi preach the other day. He said, I was preaching at a youth meeting. He said, this youth speaker got up there and he said, no, I don't want to preach today. I don't mean to come across as preaching to you young people. He said, I don't think you need preaching anymore. And he kept saying about how he wasn't going to preach. So he said, I thought in my mind, God, help this man. 
He said, what this generation needs is some spirit-filled, pointed Bible preaching. Because you know what? That's what I got saved under. That's how God called me to preach. You know, you need to live for God. You need to do what's right. It wasn't, you know, just somebody trying to placate a carnally-minded and spirited people. Because the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but heap to themselves teachers having what? Itching ears. People just tell you what you want to hear, just as long as we got a crowd and we've got the funds to take care of everything and move our little projects forward, then you know what? I'll, I'll exchange sound teaching and preaching for what you can bring to the table. And you know what? The Bible says, my people love to have it so. It's like we've got together today and we're enamored by who we are and what we can do with our pooled abilities and resources. And you know what? With all due respect, we can do a lot. Man can do a lot. And we must do all that we can do. But I've said it all these years and I say it again. There are some things that only God can do. And I'd love to see some God things in our lives, wouldn't you? I'd love to see it for my children, for your children. I'd love to see it in this church again. We've seen it before. I'd love to see it again. Hey, we've never had 2017, and we'll never get it back. But I'll tell you what, God can do some things this year that we'll never forget. Amen? Amen. Things that will last forever with people being saved. Or young people, God speaking to them, and them drawing nigh to God. Our homes being helped. I need that, don't you? We all need that. Let's bow our heads. Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes for a moment. And I trust that God knows where we're at and the Spirit of God knows where you're at. And I hope that you'll receive this in the spirit it was given, a zeal for God, for His Word, because it's His truth that sets us free. The zeal for you and for your family. And some of us have been hit and we've been hit hard. And I'm telling you, I've been there. Some of us, we truly are doing good just to be here today. And I, I don't in any way discount that. I truly don't. Now, I've been there. And I know what it's like to hold on for dear life. When you've got the wind knocked out of yourself spiritually with disappointment or hurt, or worry or need. You know, when you're younger, you got a lot more strength. And you do it certain seasons of life. And some of you are tired. At times I'm tired. I understand all that. This is not the time to, find, to try to back up on the Lord and look for resources in this world. Now I want to ask you this morning, what is God dealing with you about? How is God speaking to you? Do you know you're saved? Do you know you're saved? Do you know you're saved? How many of you have that assurance in your heart by uplifted hand? You can testify to that. God bless you. Is there anyone this morning who would say, Preacher, I don't know that if I died today, today heaven would be my home. Please remember me in prayer. I can't save you. My prayer can't save you, friend. But God will save you if you believe Jesus died for you and rose again. Will you trust him today by faith? Is there anyone this morning who would say, I'm not saved, I'm not sure that I'm saved and ready to meet the Lord. Please remember me in prayer. Is there anyone like that but at the hand, I'm not saved, I'm not sure that I'm saved, pray for me. Anyone this morning, there may be someone watching this service. God will save all those who come to him by faith. If you'll trust in him even now, God be merciful to me a sinner. You can pray that prayer of faith right where you're seated right where you are. I believe Jesus died for me. I do believe, as the Bible says, He rose again from the dead. And I turn to you, Lord, in my heart for my sin. I want your forgiveness. I want you to save me. Would you call on the Lord even now? Maybe as a Christian, God is speaking to you. I believe God wants us. He's had to help me and give me grace, sometimes unusual measure of grace, just to look to him again after being hit so hard and having the wind knocked out of me spiritually. 
trying just to get my bearings. I've been there. God wants to help you, dear friend. And don't think that he's far away from you in your struggle. The Bible says he's nigh to the brokenhearted. You say, well, I'm even doubting God, preacher, if I'd be honest with you. I understand that. And I'm glad God understands that. He can handle that. I wonder who among us would say, preacher, you know, I've, I've had the wind knocked out of me spiritually. And I just need God to help me. I truly do. I need him to help me right now. Who among us would say that by uplifted hand? I'm going to pray for you right now. Anyone like that this morning, just be honest. God bless you. God bless you. Someone else, God bless you. Someone else, I've, I've had the wind knocked out of me. And I'm just trying my best to hold on. Let's be honest with the Lord. Anyone else? Anyone else? I want you to join with me in prayer right now for these dear ones whose hands were raised. Father, in Jesus' name, we bring these dear people before you whose hands were just raised. You know the depth of their hurt, pain, or disappointment. And Lord, you know what they grapple with even right now. And we pray together in Jesus' name for them, Lord, that you would give them faith afresh to take heart and to take hold of your promise. I pray in Jesus' name that you would do a real work of grace in their hearts. God, I pray that you would buoy them up even now. And God, give them help. And Lord, give them strength. And Lord, just quicken them as only you can. Lord, thank you for the quickening power of the Holy Spirit of God. Lord, I pray that you'd quicken their hearts. And Lord, that you would help them, Lord, to know that they are not only standing in grace, but if they've stumbled, Lord, they're still in grace. May they rest in that and in your love. Nothing can cause you to love them more or less. And Lord, please help them now. And God, have mercy upon them in this moment. Right now, Lord, we pray that you would answer this prayer in their behalf and help them in Jesus' name.